Welcome to the Do More Podcast, where we share strategies and tips for improving your life in every aspect. Here's your host, John Farling. All right, today's show, we have Matt Bilger with Colliers International. He is an appraiser for self-storage facilities as well as well as multifamily in Ohio and neighboring states. And I believe I met him about five, six years ago when I started looking at self-storage. And he held a seminar uh, that was local to, to us. Uh, he's in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and I attended and I was blown away with the information that was coming out of him. Uh, I thought I knew a little bit about the space, and that was before I had my own facility. But the information that he was that he was giving to the room, and it was a free event, was unbelievable. Um, and fast forward a little bit, I've used him on several of my properties as an appraiser, and super appreciative uh, for the the information he's given for those. And he also came to uh, our mastermind, our LFG mastermind, in the springtime this year, or I guess yeah, twenty twenty three in Columbus. And he actually, uh, and I don't know if, uh, if you care me sharing this, but he started the presentation as macho man, Randy Savage, which was awesome. So, uh, I know you had the room, um, with, you know, I, I think, you know, with masterminds, especially depending on the mastermind, um, uh, there are times where you get mentally exhausted and you kind of tune out a little bit. Everyone was tuned into your presentation. Uh, it helped that majority of the room were self storage investors, but I'm sure today's show will be similar. So, Matt, welcome. Why don't you, uh, first of all, thanks for coming. Thanks for doing this. And why don't you uh, introduce yourself really quick here and, and we'll get rolling? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, uh, in addition to being an uh, old WWF, WWE fan, um, I am an investor in self storage and an appraiser. Uh, went to, uh, the Ohio State University. Um, before I even graduated, I had a uh, I had an internship um, at a local uh, uh, appraisal firm in Columbus, and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, so from about 2000 to the present, um, from 2000 to uh, I worked at that small boutique firm until about 2008, when uh, the Great Recession hit and. Uh, um, knocked me on my behind and um, there was really no work. So one of the partners decided to go to, got, got picked up to go to Collier's and uh, he invited me to go with him. So I've been with Collier's International ever since. And I've been uh, the regional director of the self-storage group. Um, I've specialized in self-storage. It's kind of one of those things when you're an appraiser, as I try to explain to people, it's like a doctor. You'll go to your general practitioner um, if you've got, uh, if you need a pack, if you've got a cold, but you don't want, you don't want your, your general pr- practitioner doing open heart surgery on you. <laughs> so that's kind of where I was the general practitioner for years. And then I moved on to making self-storage my specialty in about, about 2010. And I've averaged at about 75 self-storage appraisals a year since then. Um, it's, yeah, it's, so I get a lot of touches from, from, uh, classy product, in, you know, in, in uh, middle of nowhere to stuff um, in down, you know, class A stuff in downtowns um, all over the region. As you said, Ohio and all the states that touch it is the area that I work. Um, and if it's not me, like I said, I'm the regional director. So I also have a team that works with me. Um, can't do it all. Um, but uh, then, yeah, I do some, I do a lot of multifamily as well. But, uh, and, and those are the two asset classes that I, uh, that I invest in. And so, um, I like the product. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and podcasts like this are great because I think you have to be smarter than you used to be to invest mm-hmm. in self storage. It's, it's, it used to simply be you would throw a storage building wherever and people would move in. It's, it's getting harder because, you know, the secrets out, you know, people, uh, people know about storage now. Um, and a lot of people are building it. And so since with more competition, you gotta be a little bit smarter. So, yeah, well, and, and I want to hear kind of dive into, you know, storage as a secret and when it was a secret, you know, quotation mm-hmm. marks, but let's talk first about before we dive into, cause I'm sure there's going to be, I'm going to have a lot of questions with, with self storage in general, but as far as you being an investor, I guess, How's that look and, and what can you tell us about that? Um, as far as uh, 
your role as an investor. So you said you, you invest in, it sounds like multifamily and storage. How does that look? And yeah. since you're an appraiser, what can you share about that too? Sure. Um, multifamily, I've, I've honestly been, I'm, I'm pretty much out of it at this point. Um, okay. there, there's still a lot of, a lot of money um, to be made there. And, and, but you know, you kind of, I'm trying to stay in my lane and, and stick with one thing. I, I feel like self storage is more lucrative and really it's just not having to deal with, um, deal with tenants. I mean, you do have renters and things like that, but it's not where people live, you know, yep. God willing, I, I haven't, I haven't had to kick anyone out of, uh, uh, who has been living in any of my storage units, but uh, I've heard stories. Um, yep. But, but, you know, it's, it's, it's there, you know, there, there were a lot of issues with other asset classes that just didn't, I didn't like. And so I, I like the storage stuff. The, the thing that everyone's talking about, you know, is just, you know, interest rates. It's, it's made for the longest time interest rates, um, you know, 18 months they've been increasing. Um, it really didn't hit uh, the self storage side. It hit the multifamily side faster didn't hit um, self storage quite as fast. You could still get low interest or low uh, capitalization rates on your deals. That has, you know, I feel like time has finally caught up and it's just because there's just not as many sales um, as there used to be. And as an appraiser, you're always rear looking. You're looking in the past at old sales and the old sales had higher cap rates. And so you could continue to support cap rates even though everyone knows that, that they're going up. Um, enough times finally passed that, that that's made it a little bit more of a challenge. And, you know, with the cost of buying, with the cost of borrowing being so much higher, it's made it harder for, for investors to get deals done. Um, we, we still, even though it's been 18 months of increasing interest rates, we're still seeing a gap between what buyers are willing to pay and what sellers want. Um, there was a property that I was um, looking to invest in. And um, I, I, my, my, my offer was, was around a million dollars and they're just like, yeah, we were hoping for two. And it's just like, <laughs> okay, so that, that's a pretty big gap. You know, um, you can't, you can't always get there, you know? Um, but the one thing that makes me feel good is that interest rates and cap rates where they are, you know, we're kind of back to the level we were at in the mid 2010s, you know, give or yep. take a few years. And and, and and deals managed to get done back then, too. Right. So, you know, we all kind of are on a sugar high from enjoying the low interest rates for so long. But, you know, you just have to reset your expectations. And, you know, when times are good, it makes everyone look like a genius. When times are tough, you know, you, you got to work a little bit harder. So. There's still there's still a lot of good deals um, to be done. It's just like I said, it's just a little bit harder. Um, I did attend an economic seminar hosted by the Appraisal Institute um, last Friday. Um, that would have been what, December first. Um, and sitting with a couple of economists, um, I feel a lot better about the economy going into 2024 than I did going into 2023. Everybody knew 2023 was going to be bumpy. Um, this year it, uh, they're projecting the, the soft landing that you keep hearing about, um, you know, uh, like I believe home mortgage rates have gone down like five or six weeks in a row. So we're starting to see stuff, but really what investors want is we want, we want the rates to quit going up. We can, we can, we can pencil in the cost of money and figure things out if things will just stay stable right so that's that that's that's kind of where we're at and and the prediction is is that um that we're probably not going to see hopefully no more interest rate hikes but you know if we do it'll just be maybe one more and it might be 25 bips and the the, the problem is is you gotta you gotta worry you, you don't want um unemployment to you know if you if you raise interest rates too high, then unemployment starts going up. So the Fed is really trying to hit that sh that sweet spot of having inflation low and unemployment low. And if you do one or the other, it, you know it's, it's we're we're kind of there. So the hope is is that next year will just be stable, and um, you know hopefully a lot more deals will be able to get done. Yeah, it's well, and it's it's interesting kind of watching, especially you know majority of us. I don't say majority of us. I you know I'm early 40s. I've been investing for about a decade. So that was just after the Great Recession, right? 
uh, mm-hmm. 2008, there aren't a ton of investors right now that are active, at least in my circles, that have gone through a huge wave, right? We've just, everyone that's bought everything since basically 2010 look like experts. Um, yep. And it's been easy for everybody. So I did want to ask a little bit, you're, you're, you said you're an investor and you don't have as much multifamily. What's your role with your um, storage facility or facilities as Sounds like owner or investor or operator. How does that look? I'm, I have, I have some partners and I'm, I'm the knowledge guy, you know, um, I, I own some apartments with these guys in my hometown and because I'm not local, I love it because I'm not operations. I'm not the guy that's dealing with the clogged toilet or whatever. Um, you know, so I, we had decided to, they had, we had a piece of land and everyone kind of said, Hey, we got this land here. What should we do with it? Mm. And the phrase I was like is when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So I'm a self storage guy. And so my first thought was, Hey, we can turn this into self storage. And everyone was just like, that's an interesting idea. I've heard about what, what year was this really quick, not to interrupt. This, this was, this was probably I don't, like, early to mid 2010s, like between 2010 and 2015. Okay. And and so the property had, you know, about 25,000, uh, it, it was on a highway, about 25,000 uh, cars going by daily. So that was great. I'm um, right next to, right next to an in, the intersection with said highway. Um, it was already zoned. So that was great. But, um, you know, is it, it, it they came to, they said, okay, Matt, well, you think self-storage is the right answer. Um, use your appraisal abilities and create a feasibility study. So um, being, being an, uh, an appraiser, you're, you're basically doing what someone who does feasibility says, like I can do them. I don't like to do them, but I can. Um, and so I basically created my own template um, and, and created, like I did my first feasibility study for my own property. And I looked at, looked at, you know, um, supply analyses, saturation analyses, you know, what the population looked like in the area, um, one, three, five mile radius, uh, what the competitors, what their occupancies were. I, I surveyed the market. I, I drove to each competitor in the area. Um, and I, and I just got a real good feel for that market. It was a small market. So there was no published data anywhere. Um, it, it just didn't exist. You had, I had to go out and talk to, you know, talk to owners and, and operate managers and stuff and, 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 you know, even secret shop and all that stuff and get, get the info. And anyway, when I finished, I was like, this, this looks like a slam dunk. So we, we ended up moving ahead and um, I guess to the continuing on um, I'm still the knowledge guy. And I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm the one looking for sites, looking for people interested in selling um, cause I come into contact with so many people doing this, you know, appraising 75 a year for a decade, you're going to meet a lot of people. Now, sometimes it's repeat business and the same people, but it's, uh, it gives me a lot of touches with folks. And so, um, you know, that it, it, it helps, but it's, it's, it's really, as far as the day-to-day operations, I really don't have to deal with it in, in part because there are none in my neck of the woods. I'm the only partner who lives, um, away from everyone else and where our properties are. So, gotcha. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. So you said it was around 2010s, 15, somewhere in there when you started. You also said something when you started, uh, when we started this conversation, that self-storage is no longer a secret, right? And I've kind of heard that too. And I got in, I started looking, I think it was 2018. And I thought I missed a boat in 2018. I remember looking at deals uh, specifically local to us. And I'm like, I'm late. I can't make these deals work. Uh, Seems like everyone's already figured out that self storage is a great asset. So when do you feel timeline timeframe when storage, the secret was out basically. And I'm sure there's different levels. You're right. I mean, honestly, probably around the time you started, you know, like the, the run up to, I remember um, around, you know, around 2018, it might've been 2017, you know, I saw a public storage ad during the Super Bowl. Yeah. And 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 I remember someone was like, ooh, does that bother you? And I'm like, 
why would it bother me? You know, because people are like, oh, it's a competitor. Eh, there's not a self, there's not a public storage within, you know, 20 miles of my property. You know, no, it's not a competitor. But it's, it's great that the industry is growing up and getting recognition. Um, if I had to, you know, you know, compare self storage to a person, were were the the annoying teenager, um, but with lots of lots of life, a lot of runway, everything's in front of us, and and so just saying that the secret's out, you you're proof positive that you can still do well, and 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 what one of the things that we focus on a lot in our appraisals is, and I've mentioned it before, saturation or supply analysis. And what that is, is you, you look at, you, you get census data. It's free. You can find it online. Um, I usually look at a three mile radius around my site. If you're rural, I'd say go five, but, mm -hmm. and, and, and if, if you can do drive times, if you get, that's harder to come by, but if you can get drive time population, that's probably even better. But for most purposes, we just use miles. Yeah. Um, and so, I went, you, you go around your property and you look at, okay, well, what's the population for a three mile radius? It's this. Well, how many square feet of self, of rentable self storage space is there in that area? And, and that will give you an idea of how much products in the market just compared to everybody else. And there are different sources, but if you're like seven square feet to eight square feet per person is the national average. That's, that's also um, the average for Ohio. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, John, or they want to know, what about my state? What about my metro area? I, I have a lot of that info and I can, if, if somebody needs it, I can get it for you pretty easily. Well, well but, and you may be going into this, but I want to kind of interrupt a little bit. How important do you think that metric is? I used to think it was a lot more important, but at the end of the day, I think it's, you know, what are your rents doing? Are they stable? Are they decreasing? Are they increasing? Um, or are they, you know, and, and your occupancy, if you're occupied, do you really care if there's a lot of competition? If you're getting the rents you want, and you're well occupied. The, the thing is, is all that number is, is an average. Yep. Um, I have done properties where it's maybe like 28 square feet per person, you know, that's simple math. You know, you're, you, that, that's like four times the national average. And, you know, many years ago, I would have probably been like, ah, you might not want to invest in this. You might want to do something else. Uh, but the reality is, is that if your properties, if all your competitors are well occupied, that shows that the market can support it. Um, and, 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 and like I said, there may be a time, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years where maybe the national average is like, 15 square feet per person and everybody's still well occupied. And, and, and I'll look back at this podcast or, or when I used to advise people, boy, if you're above seven or eight, you shouldn't do it. How quaint, right? You know, it, it's just simply an average. Um, but as long as your, your occupancies are still strong and, and rents aren't, you know, you're not giving it all away in concessions. Um, it's, I don't, it's, it's just a metric for me now. It's not the end all be all that it used to be. So, well, and, and I didn't want to, I wanted to ask this towards the end, um, but this is a good time to kind of segue is I remember when you came to our event in, I think it was March or April, you talked to, I think someone asked about where do you see storage going? And I remember you saying something about, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you had to find a, a storage facility in some off beaten path and industrial complex behind whatever, you know, it was really off the beaten path. And now you'll find them on main and high street, right on the corner. And they look like a hotel. So where do you see storage going in the next five to 10 years, as far as demand? Um, and maybe further than that, I don't know, but as far as demand, rental rates, all that stuff. I, I think demand is still going to be there. Um, there was a lot of hand wringing um, a few years ago. I, I would attend events and there was a lot of hand wringing that like millennials are killing everything, you know, and, 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 and they don't, they don't buy, they, they, they don't buy engagement rings and they don't buy houses and there's downsides and doing things. As people age, you get kids yep. 
there are a lot of pressures to conform to tradition. And what we're finding is, is that people like to have space. They like to have, you know, it, it's, it's, it was overblown. The media never does that. Right. Um, it was the, the, the issue of millennials killing everything was overblown. They, they are, they are buying houses and, and doing things very similarly to, um, everybody else. And so, you know, that, that, that was overblown. I think that you are going to continue to see, you know, it's, it's, it's evolving. Um, like the so word, we're the teenager now. Um, you, you are seeing, um, a lot of nice stuff. I think, one of the biggest issues facing the industry is NIMBY. And for those who don't know what that means, that's not in my backyard. Um, you have that with certain asset classes. Uh, mobile home parks have that. Um, you know, like the, the reality is no, no, nobody wants a pig farm right behind their house, right? It smells awful and, you know, it, it's not good. Um, for whatever reason, self-storage is one of those that a lot of people, a lot of um a lot of uh, 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 the the uh, municipalities that oh, yeah. do planning and stuff they 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 want to limit it because we we kind of it was kind of the wild west where you could put them you know kind of anywhere and it, you know it's getting harder so I think that that's going to be a place where um, a lot of you could get stuff in because they would be grandfathered in um, I think a lot of municipalities and planning departments are have written storage into their bylaws and, and uh, in, into their guidelines. So, so now um, they're going to make sure that you don't get too much, too many. Um, we, we've gone through a phase where conversions have been huge and mm-hmm. a conversion is where you take something that used to be something else and turn it into something new. Um, it's very popular with self storage. Um, sometimes you can get into an area cheaper than you could if you bought the land and, did a stick or, you know, stick built property. Um, popular things to convert include, you know, car dealerships, um, old industrial buildings, old office buildings. Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of, I I've done things that I never thought I would see. Um, I've taken several Macy's department stores, which at one time were only in the best areas and, and on, you know, is the prime, you know, prime anchor for a, a regional or super regional mall storage. I've done two of them. Um, you know, big boxes are popular every, every time when, when Toys R Us went under, there was a feeding frenzy. Um, everybody was trying to get a, a, a Toys R Us to convert into self storage. Um, circuit, there's a lot of self storages that used to be circuit cities. There's a lot of, um, old Best Buys and Walmart. They had this thing where, um, happened in my hometown where you build a Walmart and if it produces good enough numbers, um, after a certain amount of time, if the numbers stay good, right, they'll go right down the street and they'll build a Walmart super center. And then the old Walmart just sits there vacant. Well, I've seen a lot of those old Walmarts turned into self-storage facilities. Maybe they split them in half and have put in like a smaller retailer and then have half of these stores. Sometimes they do things like that, but that's become very popular. So I think we're going to continue to see that, but I think it's going to get more and more challenging. Um, I think that the days of being buried in the industrial um the industrial business centers is over that was what um like i said that's kind of how the industry started now it's like they they realize that it used to be considered industrial now it's more considered retail you're rent you're you're selling boxes you're selling space and uh and people like to have it be very easy to get to and not hard to find and you know i know i know everybody's got a gps on their phone now and so location isn't as as important as it used to be. Um, but the self-storage almanac still says that, it, I forget what the number is, I'm, I'm going to make it up, but it's a very high percentage uh, of people still come to self-storage because they drove past it. Mm-hmm. And and, that, and that's why they go there. So location still doesn't matter. Um, you know, and I, I think we're just going to continue to see that. I think the REITs are going to continue to put stuff in um, where they can. REITs are creeping into secondary markets that they used to not consider. And in some cases, you're even seeing them in tertiary markets. And uh, um, that can be a double-edged sword. It can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Why is it it, it bad? Well, 
You know, you got you got Goliath moving into David's neighborhood and, uh, you know, they 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 have more money that they can bring to bear. And, you know, your 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 customers might see if, if you're a mom and pop who is just kind of, you know, on a shoestring budget, your customers are going to see what a true professional operator, how they operate and you might lose the business. Um, on the other hand, I compete against uh, uh, a, a regional player. Um, they often don't have the personal touch that the mom and pop still have. They also raise rents like it's going out of style. They'll get you in at a cheap rate, but then every three months, every month, every six months, whatever it is, they're raising the rents and, and you can get people back. Um, the, but, but that's, but that's also one, that's the positive is that there are a lot of small towns and a lot of markets where they ha- they haven't raised rents in 10 years. And I, I've had owners tell me like, oh, they, they take it as a badge of honor. It's I haven't raised rents on my wonderful tenants in a decade. And it's just like, that's great. But you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And sometimes all it takes is one person in the market to raise rents and everyone sees, they look and they see, oh, they're actually getting those rents. Okay, maybe we can too. And so I've seen it where a big operator enters a market and suddenly, you know, a few years later, everybody's rents, had, which hadn't been increased in five years, have now gone up, you know, 20%. And and uh, everybody wins. All, all boats rise in a storm. Yeah, so. for sure. So, and, and this is kind of a, a selfish question on my end, because I'm seeing this uh, in some of the markets that I'm in is municipalities do not care how much storage are going in the market and they don't understand oversaturation. They don't understand the square foot per capita is seven to eight on average. They don't understand those things. So at what point do you think they're going to, I guess, wake up? And, and you said they're already starting to realize that they can't have too much storage, but at one point is that going to happen? And how does that look? You know, obviously in Columbus, that may look different compared to a town with 20,000 people, as far as one, you got probably more experienced people in a bigger city, right? That maybe has that data easier. Um, Mm -hmm. And then smaller areas where they may not have that data and they're just happy that someone's coming in that space to pay taxes. So where do you see municipalities and how will they step in there? People don't like to change. So there's got to be a catalyst to, to make them change. So honestly, unless you're in, in a small market, unless you're going to be the catalyst for change, I honestly don't see it really changing. Um, mm. But in more in larger markets, there, there's more people involved. Um, there's a lot more money at stake. And I think, like you said, in small markets, they're just happy to have someone in there. In large markets... I've seen the issues where on the one hand for years, people would fight with um, they would make developers like, okay, you're going to take this old, this old retail center and you're going to convert it to storage. We want you to put carve out a section and, and, and white vanilla box it and have it be ready to go for retail. I've seen this again and again, where may, maybe it's like two five thousand or, or two ten thousand square foot retail spaces, and if you're lucky, maybe someone will fill them in. But if the retail corridor is so strong, why is it becoming getting converted to self storage? A lot of a lot of um, municipalities haven't accepted that the writing's on the wall and that this is a dying corridor, and so. Oftentimes, then they'll have um, a, a a smart developer will build into the um, build into that agreement that okay we will set set aside ten thousand square feet or fifteen thousand whatever it is for retail for five years three years whatever it is and if there's no interest and nobody leases it we can then convert it to storage hmm. and and you know that that happens a lot and I've seen sometimes where they get someone in sometimes where they don't um, the other the other thing is, as I've also seen some corridor places where there's there's too much, there's too much storage. Rents are um, rents are not increasing, occupancy is falling down. Um, th- this was in this was a submarket in Cleveland, um, Parma or Parma Heights, I think, and they actually put a moratorium on self storage. 
where it's just, they, they just simply said for, I don't remember if it was an unlimited amount of time or if it was like a year or two years, they basically said, we will not even consider storage within our borders for, you know, two years or something like that. Uh, so, and you may not know this answer. How do you think they got to that point? Do you think the o- local owners went to the city or how do you think it got there? I honestly, I don't know. I mean, my, it, my thought is it's either an owner complaining and, and like I said, be the catalyst for change. E- either an owner was complaining or, you know, when you're, when you're in a bigger market, you've got these city planners who, and, and folks, you know, they're, they're paid to pay attention to these things. And they looked and be like, okay, Hey, on this corridor, we've got five self storage properties. That's kind of a lot. I don't think we need any more. And, and, and so, you know, it could have been either one, but you know, yeah. when you, when you get into those bigger markets, they have people who are paying attention to these things. And, yeah. and, and, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's becoming more, I've only seen a moratorium a few times, but even if there is not a moratorium, there can be a, like I said, an unofficial stoppage to, to storage, you know, NIMBY where it's like that they'll make you jump through extra hoops and, and, um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. Well, it be, and I think this is important too, because I think, and everything that I hear is, and I, I've not built yet, I've not developed, but everything I hear is it's harder to get that type of financing to build and develop right now. And once rates do, because they are going to come down, I think we all kind of see that and, and know that. Once they do, I think development is going to open up in storage. And relatively speaking, I think it's going to be a decent amount and it could hurt some some areas and i think this is a tool that um us storage owners will probably need to have to go to municipalities and be like listen you just doubled and i'm going through this right now you just doubled the square footage in the area here how many of these facilities do you think are going to go out of business and it's going to take a few few of them go out of business before people start learning but i think this is something that we're going to have to start talking about yeah yeah, no, nobody likes to go sitting at city council meetings, but honestly, like if you're a storage owner and you're seeing things, um, you're seeing that, you know, oh boy, okay, extra space is going to put one in here and we got, you know, another another one, you know, life storage around it, extra space and life storage are now together. Um, public storage is looking at this and, and, and you know, Storage of America is looking at that and it's, I think it's up to you to bring it to their attention and, and just, yeah. you know, no, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, I, I think that um, one, one thing that I, I learned at the economic seminar when you mentioned, you know, interest rates, the thought is the economists suggested that they think that interest rates will probably stabilize. The more aggressive guy suggested somewhere in the like fives, like mid fives to six hmm. in the sixes. The other guy said six to seven. So that's kind of where everybody's thinking that interest rates are going to stabilize at least for a little while. Um, but yeah, it's, it's building is definitely a, a, a lot of, it's very challenging. And when I built mine, I remember we, we ended up using, um, there, there are a lot of good, a um, lot of good uh, uh, people to get your steel from, to get your, your kits from. I went with Tracti Um and when I talked with them, um, the guy from my region said, OK, now that we've spoken, it's going to take you five years to actually get it up and start leasing. And I was like, no, nah, no way, no way. You know, well, it took me about that long. Um, really? Yeah. It, it, now, you know, we did, we made every mistake you could make. Um, and, and we had some other things like, you know, how hard can it be in an area that's already zoned for storage? Well, we had a neighbor who didn't you know, NIMBY didn't, didn't want it there. And he complained. Uh, and, and, uh, and then in this um, business park that we'd actually built in, um, they, my site was originally three acres and they wanted me to set aside one acre for uh, water retention, oof. which, okay, you, you just killed my deal. You took away a third of my, of my site. And luckily there was land nearby cheap. And so, we went from a three acre site to a seven acre site, but then I had to completely redraw all my plans and, and, you know, have the engineer come out and redo everything. So that wasn't cheap, but we got done. Uh, the, 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 the point was, was that no one else had to do um, water retention in that entire park. Um, 
and they basically used us to build it for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're welcome. I've seen that happen too. <laughs> um, let's move to, cause I'm sure everyone, you know, wants to know kind of where obviously you've talked to interest rates and, and that's helpful. And you know, the five to seven range is it's a big range, but even the, the 10 year treasuries come down. I think the 10 year treasuries at what really low fours, maybe 4.1, so. something I, like I, that. I now. Really. Yeah. It, it's pretty low. So even if you're, fall, if you're getting, um, loans based off 10 year treasury or any of the treasuries, you're still getting um, probably six and a quarter, six and a half. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, but let's talk ca- cap rates and how, what are those looking like and how do they vary per, uh, you know, large city, tertiary and rural? Yeah. So when we, we usually classify them as class A, B and C. Um, okay. And so I, I've, I usually pull them. I pull them from a couple sources. There, there are some. There are some publications that that, that uh, put out uh, quarterly or biannually data on this. Um, I also look at sales that uh, of properties that I've appraised and and uh, things that I've researched. And I also talk to market participants. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of self storage brokers. Um, and uh, I won't I won't name any names. And uh, but I talk to several. Um, just, you know, in preparation for this meeting, because anytime someone talks to an appraiser, the most popular question, if, if, if you're doing work in Ohio, it's, it's actually cap rates are number two. Number one is taxes. How, uh, what is Ohio doing with taxes? And those of you who aren't doing work in Ohio, <laughs> you're lucky because Ohio taxes are messed up. But, uh, um, the number two is cap rates and for everyone else, cap rates is usually number one. Um, and so having spoke to a couple brokers, I have a, a, a range here. Um, and basically one of the guys does more coastal work. And so he's a few bases. He, he's maybe 50 bips or more off from everybody that's kind of active in this region. Um, if, if you're in this region for a class A facility, you're probably going to be somewhere between six, like one guy said like six to six and a half. Um, another guy said six and a quarter to seven and a quarter. Um, now a class A property. Um, I actually have a, uh, a list of, of things that we use for these. And so we, we actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different categories that we rate your property in a, B or C um location size access and exposure quality condition occupancy saturation and amenities and so you may have some some places where you rate class a um but others where you might be b or c and vice versa and so you know a class a property is going to be usually in a major msa um you're going to be 40,000 square feet or larger um, you're going to have good access to a major freeway or thoroughfare and, and good exposure. Um, your quality is going to be blick, brick, block, or tilt up, uh, paved asphalt or concrete on the ground. Um, condition is going to be new or, if not new, well-maintained um, and clean. Occupancy is going to be proved um, historically over 90%, strong fundamentals. And then saturation, um, honestly, um, having a higher, we talked about saturation levels, you know, it's actually better if you're fully built out and you can't build anymore, it's actually better to have a higher saturation number because mm-hmm. you're not going to be going through any more lease ups. And what that acts is a barrier to entry. There's a lot of investors um, like me who, who will look at saturation. Some guys don't pay attention to saturation, but a lot of guys do and gals and and if they see that, oh, geez, they're already at like 18 square feet per person, I'm going to move on and look for a easier nut to crack. Um, true. Good so point. so it, so it's one of those things where if, 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 you, if you can build no more and you're stabilized, a high number is better. Um, um, but then and then also amenities, you know, you're going to have an on-site manager. You're going to have video surveillance. You're going to have um, some places will have individual gate alarms. Um you know, you have an electronic gate, you'll have fencing, exterior lighting. Um, you may even have some of the bigger bells and whistles, like you may have drive-through storage where you actually pull the car 
into your in you get all the all the um convenience of driving your car right up to your unit like an outdoor but you don't have to deal with the inclement weather it's all inside um that, that that's something you see in a lot of class a or a plus properties um class b you know each one of these i'm not going to go through the whole thing but each one you know just gets a little bit farther down a, a class c is rural you're small you, you don't have good access and visibility um you might have a wood frame or wood paneling um, on the inside of your units. Why does that matter? Right. It, it matters because these steel kit buildings, one of their benefits is you can actually go in there with a drill and, and take down walls. And so you could have two 10 by 10s and now you have, and take down a wall in, in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and you have a 10 by 20. It gives you more freedom and more flexibility and buyers like that. Um, they like the ability to change the, the number of units and the sizes based on demand. Um, and you can't do that usually with, uh, with a, with a wood frame building or, or, uh, a, a block. Yeah. Building. Well, and, and I've got one that has, well, I've got one that's drywall, but I've got one that's wood. Um, actually I think pretty sure you've, yeah, you've appraised it. Um, it's it actually rents really well, but the demand is so great there, but there are problems with it. Um, over time, it's not going to last, as well as steel, right? There's it's just not going to. Um, right. My guess is, I think it's fi- some of it's 15, some of it's 20 years old. I may have another five to 10 years before I'm replacing a lot of the wooden there. You're not going to mm-hmm. have that with, with steel. Yeah. And, and if somebody, um, one thing that you have to just make peace with it. If you get into self-storage, people who don't drive, usually drive, who don't usually drive large trucks are going to be driving large trucks. And if you have an older facility with narrower um, driveways, they're going to hit your building. So the nice thing about steel is that oftentimes you can just take off a panel and replace it. And it's just so much easier than dealing with anything else. But anyway, back to cap rates. Um, You know, you don't have any amenities. It's just buildings sitting out there. Maybe it's fenced. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's gated. Maybe it's not. Um, All gravel, all dirt. Um, Anyway. Like I said, cap rates for the A, six to six and a, six to six and a half, maybe up to even seven and a quarter. Um, class B, which is where probably the bulk of the stuff falls, you're going to be. Um, like I said, I have one guy who was six and a half to seven. Another was was higher. He was at like seven to um, eight. And then wow. for for class C. The, the more aggressive broker was seven to eight and a half. And the, uh, the other broker just said eight plus. So that's kind of where your cap rates are. Um, and so where's, I think, I think it was helpful to um, learn about or hear about the, um, the, the qualifications for A, B and C. What is, and if anyone wants to see a list, see my list of how we grade a property reach out to John and yeah. I would be, and I'd be happy to send you my list. Yeah. Yeah. No, that'd be awesome. Um, and if you want at the end, we can, um, or in, and in the show notes, we can have your contact information if you want. Sure. Um, but it sounds like a lot of, a lot of my facilities fit under B, but I know that a lot of them are probably C. So what's the biggest distinction between C and B? Is it probably more population? We, you know, we look like, so we look at all of them, yeah. You know, some are more important than others. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that doesn't get thrown in here, and I, it, it really is more of the facility. I was going to say it's like, you know, a seasoned owner might get the benefit of the doubt on some things um, just because there there's more faith from the lender that you're going to, that you can do what you say you're going to do. Um, that, that helps more on when you're buying a property. Um, cause you might, you might buy a class C, but it's been owned by a mom and pop who, who, you know, this is their only facility. They don't really know what they're doing. They haven't raised rents in forever. They, they haven't put the money in. Um, they haven't kept it up. If you're, a, if you're an established operator and your lender believes in you and your story, you know, we can often, it's a class C now, but by the time you do this, the X, Y, and Z, we'll, we'll give it a, a class B cap rate, assuming that you're going to do these things. Right. Um, and so that that's a way to help uh, jumping ahead, but that's a way to help increase your value, have a plan and be ready to act on it. Um, I think that we probably 
I probably pay the most attention to location, um, your your quality and condition, and then probably like your your occupancy. Those those are probably the ones that that I I mean I, I give weight to all of them, but those are the ones that I probably give the most credence to. Yeah, that makes sense. What's um so expense ratio? And looking at for you when you look at expenses, are you using the who at the owner's expenses, or are you coming up and or are you coming up with your own? And are you also using you know the thirty to thirty five percent expense ratio? Yeah, great question. So we we work with what we're given. Um, okay. If if you want your appraiser to like you, help yourself out. Um, sometimes you're not going to have a good operating history because you just either you're buying the property and your, your seller doesn't, you know, they, they've written everything on the back of a napkin, you know, um, take, you know, a good operating history will help you because if you don't have that, you're leaving it up to me or what, whomever appraiser your lender chooses to, to estimate. And, appraisers as a personality trait tend to be a little more conservative. Um, I'm a little better because I'm an investor too. Um, and I'm, and I'm really buried into the self storage market, but you, you don't, it's better. Um, you don't, you don't want to leave it in the appraiser's hands. We have market data. Um, we have comps or, you know, at least I do. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's better if we can have your operating history, that's the best. It's also great to have a budget. Because if you have a budget of what you're planning on doing in the next year, it helps. It helps me. Um, now, if you completely make a budget that's just all pie in the sky BS, you know, a good appraiser is going to see that and it's like, thanks, buddy. You know, I'll put in the report, but I'm giving it no weight. But if you actually make it realistic, you can steer. This is art and science. Um, if you make it realistic, you know, I might have comps that say, you know. Uh, repairs and maintenance should be around, you know, 25 cents a square foot. That's the average of my comps that I pulled for your property. And you're, you're saying, um, I think we're going to be at 21 cents. You're close to the average. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll give you credit for that. And you know, those, those pennies add up. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's helpful. It, ideally I have three years operating history. I have a budget and then I got good comps. And, and like I said, I look at all of them. There, there are certain expenses where I place more weight on your history and others where I place more weight on comps. And so like real estate taxes, they are what they are. Um, again, Ohio has some weird situations. And depending upon if you're rural or in a major metro, I will handle your taxes differently. If you're more rural, I'm more likely to use something in line with what you've historically done in, uh, in, a, more, in a larger metropolitan area school boards chase sales. And mm -hmm. it's something that I have to, it, it's a huge deal. It's something that I always have to consider, but I'm not going to waste time on it. If anyone's interested, feel free to reach out to me. Um, utilities, they are what they are. Unless there's a story, I, I've, I've appraised properties that are right next to each other and they're, and, and they appear to be exactly the same, but like, I don't know, maybe one has leaky pipes. It, it, there's no rhyme or reason. And so I place a lot of weight on history with utilities, but again, also utilities, when's the last time your, your gas and water and electric bill went down? It, it, it generally doesn't. So don't give me a budget suggesting that they're going to go down unless you have a very good reason. Oh, Hey, we just, we just replaced all the pipes. You know, um, this isn't as big of a deal because for a lot of self storage, you don't have, unless you have climate controlled, you're not going to have a whole lot of utility costs, repairs and maintenance. Um, so I guess the fist, the fixed, expenses i i will base more on um history the the um the the non-fixed expenses those are ones that are more open to interpretation and so that's your repairs and maintenance that's your payroll or on-site management your off-site management your advertising and your gna gna is general and administrative that's kind of the slush fund that collects every expense that doesn't fit into one of the other categories um if you have a property that does not have any climate control, your expenses are going to be lower. Why? Well, because they're usually taxed less and you don't have all the utility expenses. I'd say I, 20 to 30 percent, you know, maybe 25 to 35 percent is the, the expense ratio I'm used to seeing. 
Um, mm-hmm. If you have a property that has, if, if you have property that's completely climate controlled, you could be as high as in, in a major metro area with high taxes, you could be as high, you could be like 50%. But I'd say most stuff is going to be, that's fully climate controlled. You're going to be 40 to 50%. 45 is probably the sweet spot. You, you know, you might get down to 40, you might get to like 38. If you're, if you're a property that's partially climate controlled and partially non-climate controlled, you're in between those ranges. I'd say, you know, 30, 35, 40%, something like that. Each yeah. property. So I'm just giving wide ranges. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Well, then tons of great information. Um, and I've, I've got so many questions. I've got to cut some off here, but what, um, what's rental demand done in the past 18 months? And obviously every market's different, but on average, and actually I think you sent out something email wise, I'm on your email list, uh, within the past month that I, I saw some of this data, but do you have happen to have that? Um, yes. Um, I hear you clicking. Sorry. Which yeah, yeah. No, I, I had, I had, I wasn't sure which way you were going to go with, uh, so I have, I have three screens and that's why half the time I'm looking over here and my camera's <laughs> over here. So, okay. So in the Midwest, um, overall from this time last year, rents are down, not a whole lot, but they're down. Um, like, uh, let's, let's just stick with 10 by tens. Um, a non-climate controlled 10 by 10 in the Midwest was basically a dollar 10. Um, we're used to, you know, a dollar to a dollar 10 a square foot is kind of what we're maybe dollar 15 is kind of what we're used to seeing. So it was, it was a dollar, it was a dollar, it was $110 um, dollars a month for non-climate control. It was 108 this quarter. Um, yeah. Climate control. You know, was, and, I, and I don't want to cut you off, but it just popped three years ago. What was that? Four years ago, before COVID, all that crap. Any idea what the average was? Um, off the under a dollar. What's that? Was it under a dollar? I, I, you know, before COVID, I was probably quoting a dollar, give or take. Um, okay. like I said, now I'm like a buck to a buck ten, a buck fifteen. So I, I've been creeping it up. But I'd say, you know, around pre-pandemic, I was kind of quoting like a dollar ninety-five, dollar dollar five, something like that. So, um. The uh, the climate controlled is about a buck fifty four a year ago, and now it's a dollar fifty. Or it's, sorry, it's uh, um, went from one hundred fifty four dollars to like one hundred fifty one. Um, nationally, you know, you're higher than that. Nationally is like a hundred and it's at one hundred and sixty two for climate controlled currently, and non climate for a ten by ten is one thirty. So. Um, the Midwest lags a little bit, but we also don't see the big swings that some of the other markets like the Northeast and the, the Southeast see. Um, you know, so cap rates have been going, or sorry, rents have been going down a little bit. Um, just looking quarterly, they have fluctuated. So it's like they went up, um, they went up uh, during the second quarter of 2023, um, which I guess makes sense, you know, because now you're getting into the warm period. You know, it's, it's all cyclical. You know, the warm months, you tend to have highest rents. Um, so second and third quarter are usually your best months on occupancy and rent. First and fourth are usually occupancy is a little uh, lower and uh, rents are a little lower. Um, the it's this has this has um, the 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 overall, not just in the Midwest, but in all the other um, market uh, regions, it's trending downwards as well. One thing that we've been talking about more and more is um, I, I had it written down. It's um, it's an acronym. Let's see if I can find it. ECRI, existing customer rent increase. Hmm. ECRI, that was the new at one of my last uh, meetings. Um, some lenders have been focusing on that. And that's you have customers in place. You're not usually lowering their rents, even if your 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 street rent is lowering. Um, and so what we're finding is, is that a lot of tenants who are still in place um, are seeing rent increases, even though, hmm. va- you know, a vacant unit is renting for less. So yeah. that's kind of what's happening. We're seeing a higher um, amount of um, concessions, um, you know, and, uh, you know, one month free, a uh, dollar for the first month, half off, you know, a lot of times it's, it's focused on certain 
um, certain sizes. You know, some people have dynamic pricing software, which literally changes every time a unit's rented. So, um, yeah. What else can I what? No, that no, that that's great information. Any idea what occupancy's done in the past year? Yeah. Occupancy um, has dropped a little bit. In the Midwest, a year ago, we were averaging about 89. We, we were 89.1. Now we're 88.8. .8, so negligible difference. Um, nationally, we were 89.3. And now we're 88.5. So not a whole lot of movement. Um, it's pretty much the same in all the, all the regions. Which is funny because that's completely different from anything that I hear. Um, I would say those are probably, and it's tough for me to verify that because I'm all over the place. I'm buying more properties. I'm adding some units here. So it's I'm not at all stabilized anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But my I would say my rent growth has gone up. But yeah, that's definitely not what we're hearing. This is we hear industry. that demand is dropping significantly. Um, rates are dropping significantly. So is that just kind of the news? Is that just bad information that we're getting? I think that the coasts, like in all real estate, have an outsized influence on the national perception. Mm -hmm. We're flyover ter territory in the Midwest. And, yeah. um, you know, we don't see the swings that, that we see in that they see in other in other parts of the country. Um, which can be, you know, has, is good or bad. Um, but like when they're, they're definitely, you know, like politics, all politics are local, all real estate's local. Um, honestly, if you're doing great in your three mile radius in your little bubble, who cares what's happening in, in, in the larger landscape really. And, and, and so it's, there are areas that are overbuilt. And that are really struggling. Um, like I said, there's a lot of there's a lot of places in uh, like I said on the coast that have some issues. Um, larger cities, you know, but like for a lot of your product, John, it what you're telling me doesn't surprise me at all. I'm seeing um, I'm seeing rents continue to increase, not at the same clip that we saw. Um, right. Even in the Midwest, like it, it's funny. We you don't want to get too far out over your skis as an appraiser, and so you know. We, we would say like, you know, we might see eight to 10% annual increases in rent, you know, and it wouldn't be uncommon, but in the appraisal, we, we might only give you credit for like 3%. And, you know, it, it's, it's the, the banks like to loan money on what you're achieving, um, not necessarily what you hope to achieve, you know, so it, we, we get, we get handcuffed a little bit there, but, uh, you know, in general, I'm still seeing growth on most of the, you know, again, all my properties that I'm doing is Ohio and the surrounding states. And we tend to, I'm still seeing rent growth for the most part. Values are yeah. falling, but that's, that has to do with the cap rate, not necessarily to rents and, you know, occupancies are creeping up. But again, that is a, you know, case by case basis. Each area is different. If your area is doing fine, I'm not going to penalize you because like I, I always sur comp uh, survey the competition. I'm not going to penalize you because the national narrative is that occupancies are declining. If your area is doing good, that's what matters. Yep. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head that that I think needs to be, um, I, I guess, brought up, addressed, um, is real estate is local. And especially, you know, the Midwest, we are more, we're not going to see, now with, single, with real estate in general, we have seen a big upswing in values in the past three to four years. But it was due, right? We we saw mm -hmm. steady where we saw basically even, um, um, geez, um, over the past ten over past decade, um, values didn't really go up. They stayed even for the most part. So we we were due for that. Um, but yeah, real estate is local. Uh, even for myself, I'm in I think five or six different towns. The demand is different every single one. The values are. are somewhat different every single one rental rates are definitely different every single one so you've got to know your market um mm -hmm. and midwest it is a little bit easier I, I, in my opinion granted I'm, I'm here but it's in my backyard it is a little bit easier you're not going to have those big swings like the coast so you see you walk a lot of storage facilities obviously some 
chunkier ones, probably some of mine, and some nicer ones. Where do you see what new technology or, and it doesn't have to be technology, but maybe things that people have put in place in the past year or so, um, not necessarily unmanned facilities because that's you know kind of the big thing that's been happening over the past three or four years, but other than that, maybe Noki or something like that, what are owners putting in these these that, numbers? That was you actually you, that was the first thing I was going to suggest. Noki was the first thing that I thought of, and that's I believe that's yeah. Janice. Um, so for those who don't know, Noki is it's you basically when you get a unit, you get a fob, and that's your key. And you just, you know, you, you swipe the fob and, and it unlocks your unit. And, and, and you also use that fob to get into your um, to get into the facility. And it's all done. You know, it's all it's all computerized. And, and so, like, when you swipe, when you when you put the fob up, they know that Matt Bilger is entering the building. And the only thing that my key, my fob will work on if it's a multi-story building, it will get me into the elevator and it will get me up to whatever floor my building's on or my, my unit's on. Um, yep. if, if I try to go to the third floor and it's on the second floor, I can't do it. Um, you know, and, and it's only going to unlock my unit. Um, and sometimes they have, you know, they, a lot of times they have the extra feature where you can also have a physical lock on there too, if you like. Um, that it, That's a neat feature. I think that if you are in a high crime area or I, I've seen some places where they use that for, it's, it's really neat. I think um, they use one of these systems for like, we I saw it was a property that was fully fenced in and barbed wire and all the lighting and all that stuff. But then they had one building that was like up front and it faced the road and it formed like the Southern wall of the property. Yeah. And so these units were accessible from the outside and, and there wasn't enough room or city zone. They couldn't put in, they couldn't fence these in. And so like they simply installed those just on this one building. And, and so that, that way it's like, there was no locks to cut. You know, it's like you live, you're literally going to have to cut into the wall to get in. And, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and so I thought that was a, you know, a really interesting, you know, because it is expensive. It's yep. expensive and, and in a lot of markets, it's not going to be cost feasible to do it. But yep. if you're in a market like that, I, I think that's a great situation to use it. Um, and and you can use your phone for that too. I've looked into it a little bit. So you can either use a fob for the people that don't want to use their, their smartphone or don't have yep. their smartphone, or you can use your phone. It can do the yes, same. same right. function. Yes, you can use your phone. And so, I, you know, that's where everything's going. I think, you know, the new build product, you know, properties, I think, uh, especially in larger metros, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of the, everybody's using their phone, you know, um, kiosks are one of those things where some people love them. Some people hate them. I have one at my facility. Um, you know, it, it made sense for us. It doesn't make sense for everybody. Um, you know, same deal. You got to have a large enough facility to, to, justify that cost mine's like thirty thousand square feet and it's it made it so that we didn't have to have a uh person there full time so it worked for us um geez as far as other as other things um i haven't seen like like tech technology wise i guess i'd say there's um the other thing is um Portable storage has come a long way in the last few years. Mm, yeah. um, there, Janice makes some Boxwell. Uh, you know, there there are several ones, and and I'm not talking like cargo containers. Yeah. Um, these are um, port portable units, and the cool thing is that they, they're a lot better than they used to be. Um, last time I talked, the the effective life is about 25 years, so. They're not going to last as long as a site built storage facility, but um, it's one of those things where I haven't seen it actually properties that have some of these. I've never actually seen it impact the value in a negative way. Now, hmm. maybe as when I start appraising these 20 years from now and they've only got a few years of useful life left, maybe then it becomes more of an issue. But for the time being, um, it's not. And I think that when these things are, uh, most places don't have all their all their units be these. These are supplemental because yep. they're not they're chattel. They are not improvements. 
They're not buildings. And so you can literally put them right on your property line. And so um, your, your site may be fully built out, but you actually, you, you have, you have a space on like your back, uh, the, the rear of your property. You don't have, you, you don't want to put parking in there or maybe you're not allowed, um, you know, and you don't have enough room to put in a new building because of, because of setbacks, but you could put a row of these in and suddenly you just, you just added, you know, 20 units to your property. And um, some lenders will not give you credit for this income. Um, some lenders, it has to be permanently affixed to the ground. Um, mm -hmm. Usually like if, if it's some, it, literally, if, 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 if it's bolted or not, like, you know, that, that's the difference of getting credit. And, and then there's other lenders who have, um, grown accustomed to this income and are okay with it. And, and you don't have to do anything special to get credit for it. So that's, you know, th those are some interesting things. Um, are, are you valuing about. those the same as, you know, your stationary buildings? Yes. For the time being, okay. um, as I said, that's why I was saying in the future, when they get closer to their, the end of their effective life, if, if they're just not holding up as well, you may have to start, there may start being, uh, you know, some additional renovation or, you know, uh, repairs and maintenance or reserve costs that you have to deal with. Um, if you have a property that's filled with these things, maybe it affects your cap rate. Um, but at this point, you know, we're valuing the cash flow, So we're not, it, it doesn't, it's not having a negative impact. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so before we wrap up here, what, what, what haven't I asked? What do you want to, do you have anything else that you want to share? You've given us so much information that um, I will probably re-listen to this episode, but anything else you can give us? Um, I, I'll touch on just a couple expenses. Um, so I, th I think when I'm doing properties that are smaller, um, I often get the question about offsite management versus onsite management. Also, sometimes we call it offsite is management fee. And on site is payroll. Um, these are honestly the hardest things for me to do as an appraiser um, because if I'm doing a large property, you've got both. You've got to pay a management fee. It's usually between four and six percent. And I, I think I usually just use five, um, five percent of your EGI. Um, and as for payroll, if it's a larger property, you've got someone there, you'll have history of your what you're paying your manager. Um, and part-time help. And, and, you know, I have comps that, that I can use, but if you're a smaller property, it's like, well, I pay someone part-time or I, I do it um, all myself or, you know, how, how would you handle that? I actually got that phone call. I get this phone call fairly regularly and, and it really is on a case by case basis. I try not to be too punitive, but you do have to understand an appraiser is valuing a property based on how a buyer is going to look at your property. Every appraisal assumes a sale, even if you're just doing a refi. So if you're doing something that's atypical from the market, it's like, oh, well, I do, I run it all myself. Okay, that's great. But your property's large enough, it's very likely that a buyer is going to buy it and they're going to hire a manager. So it's great that you're doing it, running it yourself, and you're pocketing that money that you would have spent on a manager. But for valuation purposes, I have to treat it the way the market's going to look at it and they're going to put in a payroll. And, and so, you know, but, but again, if you're a very small property, like I've done it several different ways, maybe instead of a, a 5% management fee, I'm going to use 8% and then I'm not going to charge you a payroll or maybe I'll, you know, I'll put in some modest amount, maybe 15, 20 cents, 25 cents a square foot, just to, you're going to have either you're doing it yourself or you're paying somebody to come out and sweep out units and, you know, maybe pick up the rent, you know, pick on, 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 uh, you know, the fifth or whatever. And, you know, so I, it's really on a case by case basis and depends upon what your specific situation is. But that's something that that's a sticking point where a lot of owners get irked at me because I don't handle it the exact same way that they do. Um, the other thing is, is a lot of owners don't use um, reserves. Um, mm -hmm. And what are reserves? If, if you don't know, if you don't use reserves, you probably don't know what they are. These are major capital expenditures that you have to spend over time. And, it's honestly been the same number for the 20 years I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. If it's, if, if you're doing an apartment, it's $250 a unit. If you're doing 
self storage, it's 10 cents a square foot. And, and so 10 cents a square foot is, is something that's going to get tacked onto your expenses every time, at least when you work with most appraisers. Um, and so, you know, GNA is also the one that can bounce around enough because a lot of times you find people putting, you know, they, they, they get, they got their, 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 you know, there's all kinds of stuff that can be, that can be buried in there. And so we, we often take a close look at that, but that's really it. Um, you know, Maybe we'll get together again sometime and we'll, um, if uh, listeners and viewers have questions, um, specific questions, we could do kind of a Q&A one. Um, and That'd be awesome. certainly I could talk for a long time about how to maximize your value. But we're at what, an hour 10? I kind of feel like maybe we <laughs> save that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> no, you... Man, you you had so much information here. Again, I I think I'll probably have to. Re- I've I've never listened to a pot one of my own shows. Uh, I think it's weird, but I'll probably re-listen to this one because <laughs> ton of great information. And yeah, I, I think probably a part two, or maybe we'll do a, a Facebook live and yeah. announce it and see how many people we can get on and and uh, ask questions live. Um, but appreciate you coming on. Um, do you want to give out your email or anything? And we don't have to give it out now. I can put it in the show notes. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and if, if not, um, they can hit me up at l4investing.com and, um, or Facebook or whatever, and, and I can, you know, put you guys together. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and put in the show notes. Um, it's just matt.bilger at colliers.com. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm available. Um, half of, half of what I do is, uh, educating, uh, um, educating investors. So, um, if you've got a question, I'm happy to help. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, again, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate all the information that not only you've provided on, on this show, but uh, the event we had in March and, you know, that just continue and continually putting out great uh, information for us storage owners. Um, yeah. Till oh, next time. We'll see you guys I have, later. I have, a yeah. quarterly right. news, I have a quarterly newsletter that Collier's yeah. puts out. And if you want it, send me an email and I'll get you added to my mailing list. Yep. Highly recommend. I'm on a few of them and yours is the only one that I read. So highly recommend (laughs) signing up for that. All right. Now we're signing off. We'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thanks for following, subscribing, and listening to this episode of the Do More podcast hosted by John Farling. To learn more or ask questions, go to l4investing.com.